Greetings and good afternoon. I'm Andrew Davis, Dean of the McGovern College of the Arts at the University of Houston. And I am really pleased that you could join us today for the launch of Healing Arts Houston, a nine month series of events that is part of the Global Healing Arts Series dedicated to supporting the role of the arts in all areas of community health and healthcare and to advancing research, practice and policy in the arts and health. We are live streaming to you from the campus of the University of Houston in the center of the great city of Houston, a global leader in both health sciences and the arts. We have two distinguished guests who we have invited to briefly introduce today's event and I would like to introduce them both now before handing over the microphone to them. First, Stephen Spann is founding dean of the College of Medicine and vice president for medical affairs at the University of Houston. He has previously served on the faculties of the Baylor College of Medicine, the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, the University of Oklahoma and Wake Forest University. And Steve is a graduate of Baylor University, the Baylor College of Medicine, Duke University and the University of Texas. Second, Christopher Bailey is the arts and health lead at the World Health Organization based in Geneva, Switzerland. And in fact, Chris is joining us remotely today from his home in Geneva. The WHO's arts and health program is centered on supporting the research agenda, facilitating community implementation, and mobilizing the global media, all to explore, understand, and support the health benefits of the arts. Chris was educated at Columbia University, Oxford, and the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York, and he previously had a career as a professional actor and playwright. So thank you again for joining us, and I will now welcome my friend and colleague, Steve Spann, to the podium. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Healing Arts Houston Innovations in Arts and Health Launch Symposium. We wish we could all be participating together in person today, but we can't, so we're glad that you can join us virtually for this important symposium. The University of Houston College of Medicine has been pleased to participate in the planning and organization of this event, which is so highly relevant to our mission, which is to be accountable to society for improving the overall health and health care of the population of Greater Houston, Texas, and beyond. The Constitution of the World Health Organization, developed in 1946, defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. We now estimate that 80% of preventable disease and death in our country is due to adverse social determinants of health including socioeconomic factors, health behaviors and lifestyles, and the physical environment. Only 20% is due to suboptimal clinical care. There's a growing base of scientific evidence documenting the role of the arts in promoting health and well-being and preventing illness, as well as managing and treating acute and chronic disease. For example, the arts can help ameliorate adverse social determinants of health by helping to improve social cohesion, encouraging health-promoting behaviors and lifestyles, supporting caregiving by enhancing clinical skills of healthcare professionals, helping individuals experiencing mental illness, assisting in the treatment of non-communicable diseases, and supporting end-of-life care. Today's launch symposium will introduce us to the role of healing arts leadership in uniting research, practice, and policy for the arts and health. We will learn about the importance of advancing policy in support of improving health. We will enjoy a recorded dance performance that explores the effects of four seasons and isolation on mental health. And we will learn about an integrated, comprehensive arts and medicine program in the Texas Medical Center in our city. 
the COVID pandemic has adversely affected the physical, mental, and social well-being of the world's population. Perhaps more than ever, we need the healing that the arts can bring to our lives. As a practicing physician, I look forward to learning more today about how I can use the arts as a therapeutic tool in caring for my patients. I am confident that we will all find today's symposium to be inspiring and useful in our daily work and lives. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Steve, and I'm happy to turn the floor over now to Chris Bailey in Geneva. Thanks, Andrew. Um, great to hear uh, from Stephen, and uh, I can't tell you how pleased we are to be participating in uh, the this uh, Houston event, as uh, we, we are always on the lookout for innovative and progressive uh, approaches to how the arts can improve health, uh, particularly at the community level from around the world. And when we heard about what was happening in the Houston area, we became interested and that started a conversation that eventually led uh, to this event. And we're very pleased to be here. Um, and I'll save my more lengthy comments uh, for later. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thank you again to my friend and colleague, Steve Spann, uh, for introducing the event. So let's get underway with the launch event for Healing Arts Houston. As Steve said, we have four uh, sessions scheduled for today, uh, where the first session today is entitled, Uniting Research, Practice, and Policy for the Arts and Health. And this session will comprise a keynote talk by Chris Bailey, who you just met, followed by a panel discussion by the leading figures in the Global Healing Arts Initiative. I will wait until the panel discussion commences to introduce the panelists. So the best thing right now is for me to turn the floor back over to Chris Bailey for his keynote address. Chris, it's all yours. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the arts and health lead at the World Health Organization. Now, for some of you, that sentence might alone might seem a little strange. Why would WHO be interested in the arts? Well, uh, the truth of the matter is WHO has used the arts to advance health from the beginning, from posters to concerts to radio dramas, movies, even uh, a glossy magazine in the 60s. Um, efforts around the world, both local and global, using the arts to advance pro-health messaging. This use of the arts is not controversial. It's a kind of social marketing that every profession uses. But it does beg the obvious question, why are people more likely to believe a poster, a song, a, a dance, or a story, rather than, say, a technical research report outlining the evidence? Well, the answer is both obvious and elusive. I mean, from a WHO perspective, why should I go the long way around to tell a story or sing a song when the presentation of scientific data alone should convince you? And no, the answer to that conundrum is not better scientific literacy, although it wouldn't hurt, as even scientists are prone to this bias. The obvious answer is that our brains are wired so that emotional connections created through artistic engagement demand our attention in a way that mere presentation of facts do not. The less obvious answer is why. What we are discovering is that facts tend to be processed in the part of the brain where we solve problems, which of course makes sense. But deeply held convictions and sense of identity are housed in a different part of the brain. To have real behavioral change, change where we reshape our mental models, our view of the world, our relationships, and ourselves, we have to take a different neurological pathway. By unlocking the biochemical and neurological mechanisms of identity and connection, the question becomes about more than just merely convincing someone of a point of view. We unlock the ability for us 
to literally change our minds. To be fair, even at WHO, this sometimes feels far afield. Once when presenting this new program, a senior colleague pleasantly dismissed the arts as merely recreational. I said, but listen to that word, recreation. That's healing. So what do we mean when we say the arts can heal? Well, let's start with what we don't mean. We don't mean that the arts can necessarily cure anything. I happen to have terminal glaucoma. I've lost 95% of the mass of my optic nerve. No amount of artistic engagement is going to regenerate my optic nerve, nor will current science. We can control the ocular pressure to some degree to slow the disease's progress, but there is no cure. Just as the arts will not cure cancer, depression, dementia, or stupidity or brutality for that matter. So how do the arts heal? They can comfort, they can distract, certainly. They can also lower stress and foster a more healing state of mind and body. They can help contextualize what we are going through and build connection and community. But ultimately, they can also help us imagine a path towards even in the face of tremendous adversity. And even if a catastrophic outcome is unavoidable in say a terminal cancer diagnosis, the arts can help us find expression for our situation and help us create personal and authentic meaning. As we think about the difference between healing and curing, let's Let's remind ourselves what Stephen mentioned in his introduction of the WHO definition of health from, 1947, uh, from the 1947 Constitution. Health is defined not merely as the absence of disease and infirmity, but the attainment to the highest level of physical, mental, and social well-being. Our definition of mental health goes even further. Mental health is not about the absence of diagnosable conditions. It's about whether or not we can cope with the everyday stresses of life. Can we achieve the highest potential of our abilities? Are we productive? Are we contributing to our community? If the answers to all these questions is yes, then we have mental health, regardless of what diagnosable conditions we may or may not have. Rather than medicalize health and stigmatize the unwell, we focus on well-being and see illness as something to be eliminated when we can, if not managed, but with a focus on how you live a productive and full life regardless, not the elimination of all medical conditions at all costs. The arts not only support all of these aspects of health, physical, mental, and social, but by its very nature, accepts this holistic view of human well being and happiness. Otherness is not rejected or eliminated, but incorporated and celebrated by the artist. Rather than rejecting the other, we place ourselves in their shoes and bring them into the narrative, their, their uniqueness, helping us build and transform, dare I say, curate the story of our lives. As Carl Jung once said, loneliness is not the absence of people. It is the inability to express what matters to you most. Now, for those of you who have seen the WHO report on the evidence based health benefits of the arts. You're aware of how the arts in the clinical setting can lower cortisol levels, speed recovery, and may even help slow or assist in prevention of some health conditions. Increasingly, researchers are finding ways of measuring these benefits in robust ways, from biomarkers such as the cortisol levels to specific outcome measures of physical, mental, and social well-being. By looking at the health benefits of the arts in a robust and measured way, we hope over time to synthesize this evidence 
into specific policy recommendations from member states with the goal of showing how investment in the arts is an investment in the health of communities. In this day of people talking over each other and defining ourselves by denigrating others, the arts can help, can help us relearn how to listen deeply, to look more carefully, to pay attention to others and the world around us, to make connection rather than division. That state of deep aesthetic engagement gives us a profound sense of presence and connection. The temporal lobe of the brain where time is artificially reconstructed into a linear construct so we can understand it better, our sense of past and future has given us a great evolutionary gift. From our sense of the past, we can learn, and from our sense of the future, we can plan. But this same ability is also the source of much of human suffering. For with our sense of the past comes a profound sense of loss. And with our sense of the future comes a terrible sense of dread. In our society, we spend too much time in the past and the future and less and less time acknowledging and savoring the present moment. The arts can heal the schism, bringing past, present, and future into a unified experience, creating meaning and peace. Now I'm gonna tell a few stories of what happens when the artistic ability is allowed personal expression. And because data is not the plural of anecdote, I'm not presenting these as evidence necessarily, but as an illustration to the kind of, of revelation and discovery and transformation that can happen through the artistic experience. There was a case in Mumbai where we were working with the Dalit people, which uh, in the old caste system was considered uh, the, the, the lowest class. And there was a project to help teach the young women uh, and older women uh, what health services were available to them. And to do that, the idea was to take these women who have had to use the health services and to develop songs, dances, plays, posters, uh, et cetera. And in the first session, the women were gathered around and pieces of paper and writing utensils were passed so that they could begin by just writing about their own experiences seeking healthcare. And as soon as the paper and pencils were passed, one of the women took her sheet of paper and held it up and said, what am I supposed to do with this? And the organizer said, well, you're supposed to write down your thoughts on how you access healthcare. And she goes, well, I work as a fishmonger. Why would I ruin a perfectly good piece of paper that could be wrapping fish? And another woman was looking visibly distressed and upset and was clutching her pencil. And they asked what was wrong. And she told the story of how when she was 16 years old on her wedding day, she was forbidden by her husband who was much older to ever hold a pencil again. And this was the first time she had held a pencil since that day. Now we move to Iraq and there was a prison there where WHO had a program trying to use drama therapy to help with the prison inmates. Uh, there was a very high level of violence uh, in the prison. And many of the prisons, many of the prisoners were former child soldiers or, or just children who happened to be associated with uh, combatants, many of them there without trial. The rate of 
depression, anxiety, suicide, violence was very high. And in the first attempt to bring drama therapy into this prison, plays were developed where it was hoped that they could bring out some of the emotions and feelings uh, of the prisoners. And most of them did not respond to this. So there was a change of plan. And instead of presenting material to them, instead, the young inmates were taught basic story structure and were given the ability to actually tell their own story. And they began by telling the story of what happened to them in the war, what happened to them with their families. And over time, that story began to emerge into wish fulfillment of what, what it would be like to meet a woman and fall in love, which at that moment seemed an impossibility. And as these stories began to evolve, the stress levels and the symptoms of depression and anxiety began to drop, not just for the prisoners, but for the staff of the prison as well. A community was being formed, even within the walls of a prison. Now, I take you to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where dance was being used with women who had experienced assault. Many of them were exhibiting the, the symptoms of disassociation. They felt unsafe in their own bodies. By using music and dance, slowly they were able to create a sense of safety within their own bodies and welcome back to repossess their bodies and welcome back their spirit. And furthermore, to use gesture to begin to own the space around them again. Now we go to Edinburgh, where a clinical clown is going to a care center for older people with dementia. And many of these patients are in the latter stages of dementia and have shown little to no social interaction for months. The television is on, but they're not even looking at it. It's just filling the air with noise. And this clown begins by crying. And eventually one or two of the patients asks what's wrong. And she says, it's Valentine's Day and nobody has sent me a Valentine. And then way in the back, this Irish man who has not interacted with any other person for weeks, suddenly gets up in front of the crowd, bends down on a knee and sings an Irish love ballad. With a group of Navajo artists that we were working with, there was one Navajo artist who described an incident where her mother had been assaulted in a bad neighborhood. Asking her mother's permission, on the wall in the alleyway where she was assaulted, she painted a three-story portrait of her mother's face looking proud and defiant. Not only did her mother feel emboldened and empowered by this, but the crime rates in the neighborhood dropped to zero. And now I'm going to tell my own story. When I lost my sight, it was like a death to me. I felt exiled and excluded from the world. And like a death, I went through all the different phases. I, there were times when I was angry. There were times when I was in denial. There were times when I, I bargained, you know, if I eat something or do this exercise, maybe my sight will improve. And eventually I came to acceptance. And part of acceptance was adapting 
some of the assistive technology, the white cane, uh, learning echolocation. But even with acceptance, the world still felt polluted, dirty, and meaningless. But I was able to function. Just before the pandemic, I was asked to perform at an event at the Welcome Collection in London. And in order to get myself into the frame of mind, I decided to see a lunchtime concert at St. Martin in the Fields. And one of the reasons why I like to do this is as a blind person or severely visually impaired in my case, listening to music is not just the beauty of the music, but I hear the Mozart or the Bach or the Brahms actually passing through the physical matter of the world around me. Unlike light, which is merely a reflection of matter, sound passes through it. It becomes more immediate and more palpable. Well, as I'm crossing Trafalgar Square to try to get to St. Martin in the fields, I'm in this crowd. It was before the lockdown. And I get buffeted about by the tides of humanity and eventually I become disoriented and, and, and my heart is panicking and I'm realizing that I'm having an anxiety attack because I can't see and I don't know where I am and I, I, I don't know what's happening. And I find myself tossed ashore on the wrong side of the square in front of the National Gallery. And my heart sank because museums had always been a place of joy and discovery and beauty for me. And I had avoided them since losing my sight because I felt being inside would be too painful. But to escape the crowd, I went inside anyway. And I found myself in this gallery and I was looking at these large paintings and began to recognize where I was. I was in the Turner Room with the, the misty, stormy seascapes that he painted in the 19th century. And at that moment, as I was looking at the mist and the spray of the ocean, I could actually taste the salt, the salt water on my cheeks. And I realized it was the tears coming from my eyes. There was something about the triangulation between the artist, long dead, the object and myself that brought me into another state where for the first time since losing my sight through the eyes of Turner, I could imagine that the way I see the world and the way he saw the world and painted it could be beautiful. And it was through this triangulation that I began the final part of my journey of navigating to a safe emotional harbor just as you close your eyes to better savor a glass of red wine, just as you willingly closed your eyes to better embody a beautiful piece of music, just as you willingly close your eyes to trace the gentle slope of a lover's forearm, so too do I accept the closing of my eyes to better share this moment with you. To me, that's the healing power of art. Thank you. Chris, thank you for a powerful talk. And we will uh, now move on to the panel discussion portion of the session. So allow me first to introduce the other panelists. From left to right on your screen, Professor Floret Fernando is founding director of the Arts Leadership Program and associate dean for academic affairs in the McGovern College of the Arts at the University of Houston. 
where she has built an academic program that touches all areas of arts management and leadership, including the graduate certificate program in arts and health. Florette has had a career as a director, choreographer, educator, and arts administrator in the San Francisco Bay Area, in Montreal, and in metropolitan Houston. She is a graduate of the Claude Watson School for the Arts, the National Theatre School of Canada, and York University. Nisha Sajnani is a professor at New York University, where she is director of the program in drama therapy, director of the Theater and Health Lab, a founding co-director of Arts and Health at NYU, and a faculty member at NYU Abu Dhabi. Her teaching and research centers on evidence for the health benefits of the arts in conjunction with practice and policy. Stephen Stapleton is an artist, educator, and social entrepreneur who works in international cultural production, education, and diplomacy. He is the founder of several nonprofit organizations, including the Edge of Arabia, the Crossway Foundation in the United Kingdom, and Culture Runners, which Stephen founded at MIT in 2015 as an organization dedicated to developing artist-led initiatives that use culture to transform communities, societies, and systems, and inspire empathy across ideological and geographical borders. Uh, and incidentally, Culture Runners established the Future is Unwritten, the Healing Arts Initiative in 2020 as part of the program surrounding the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists, including Chris Bailey, who you just met, of course. And let me get the conversation started a little bit here by turning first to Stephen Stapleton. And Stephen, why don't you tell us, uh, to start us off, a little bit about the history and the origins of the Global Healing Arts Initiative. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, I was nervous that the PowerPoint wasn't <laughs> going to come up, because I definitely am re relying on that. I'm, I'm imagining a, a, an auditorium full of University of Houston students, even though there's not people here because of the pandemic, but just wanted to say thank you to the university. Nisha and I are being made to feel very welcome, and it's an amazing campus, and we can't wait for this program to run forward. Um, we had a few introductory slides. That's already happened. So I, I'd like to just um, uh, go back to the origins of healing arts um, and explain. You've, you've all seen this phrase, the future is unwritten, um, above the project. You probably don't know it's a quote from Joe Strummer, the famous lead singer of The Clash, British uh, punk band. Um, and healing arts emerged out of this project, the future is unwritten. And I kind of used this slide and deconstruct it as a way to explain um, how it came about. So in the background of this slide is Edvard Munch's um, mural, The Sun, which is actually uh, covers a whole wall of the University of Oslo, which I thought was uh, appropriate to bring it to this university. And um, he was inspired to paint it uh, by a scientific movement that championed the role of nature in improved health benefits. Uh, I'm uh, partly Norwegian, so I'm also choosing it because he's my countryman. Um, in front of that image are the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, the 17 goals that took 20 years to agree on between 192 countries. when the climate crisis and these emergencies were emerging. So I think the future is unwritten was established by a group of us trying to be that bridge between the art world and the United Nations uh, goals. Now, it just so happened that it coincided with UN 75, so the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. And the United Nations, of course, was formed in the aftermath of World War II. Um, 85 million people died, and it was an urgent you know, establishment of a cooperating body to say we cannot let this happen again. But 75 years later, our challenges were different. And as we, as we launched The Future is Unwritten, it was all 
about climate. Climate was the, the priority for the UN. And so our project was asked by the UN to start dialogues between the art world um, and the United Nations in order to sort of mark this 75th anniversary. And then in, in, at the beginning of 2020, of course, COVID hit. And it kind of came at this extraordinary moment in, in history and in the UN's history. Um, oh, there's some music up there. Um, and um, I was in this position working on The Future is Unwritten, and I got introduced to Chris Bailey. Um, who was arts and health lead at the World Health Organization. And he, he asked me, he said, can the art world um, support the WHO in this moment? You probably remember, we all remember the beginning of the pandemic. It was, our world changed very quickly, and um, uh, the WHO was scrambling, and health institutions were scrambling, and Chris had actually just organized or helped organize the concert with Lady Gaga uh, together at home concert, which had raised $180 million for the emergency response. And he said to me, could we work with the art world with a similar response? And this was the emergence of the healing arts. So Chris and I and a group of us, we, we decided, okay, let's, let's start something. And we called it Healing Arts. And initially it was just a fundraising platform to try and raise money to support the production of, uh, of vaccines, to support the emergency PPE. Um, and so we, we launched with a, an auction series with Christie's. Um, you see on the right, this was our first auction. And we, we, we sort of just went in a bit, um, a bit blindly. And then we, we very quickly realized that this was, a, this was a serious moment for all sectors. And the art world was no different. And we became a kind of center point for all these different communities to come and, and start to think about what was the role of art during the pandemic and what, was, and what emerged was a real focus on mental health and the role of the arts in supporting all this isolation, all this anxiety that was, that was escalating. And we, we started to sort of formulate a project. And what we did is we started to activate cities. We're in Houston now, but we started uh, our first activation in, in London in 2020, and I think we have a little video that shows a little bit of that. I think you guys have to play that at the back. With audio. Well, we can imagine the audio. It's very, it's very dramatic. Maybe we can, we can come back to that. And um, we, we did this launch in London. We worked with uh, Tate. We, worked, we managed to get Dr. Tedros, the Director General uh, of the WHO, in conversation with Gillian Anderson, who had just won a Golden Globe for the Crown, in conversation with Anthony Gormley. And we realized this power of the arts to convene people around a subject and the energy that it builds. And from, um, from London, we went to Venice. And we recognized, of course, it was very easy for this to become a sort of Western-centric um, project. And we were introduced, actually, to an amazing project in Iraq called Arc Reimagined. And we managed, through a coalition of organizations, to facilitate the first ever Iraq pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale. And the project was focused on post-conflict healing. And places like Iraq, which have been through you know, decades of trauma, you know, one of the important roles of arts and crafts is to address that kind of post-traumatic community mental health issues. And this project which is such a beautiful project. It's a reimagining of the Noah's Ark story, not as a single boat, but as a constellation of many boats based on the actual geography where the Ark story probably originated, which is the Tigris-Euphrates River. And it's really a metaphor for what we need to do now, not jump into Elon Musk's spaceship or wherever they're gonna go, but to actually join together. And the Ark is not a singular supernatural event, it's, it's a metaphor for collaboration. So we managed to, to produce the first ever Iraq pavilion 
there. And then just last year, and Andrew was there, we, uh, we were invited to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to do our first big symposium. And something very interesting happened here, and it was really here that we linked up with the academic institutions. Nisha came on board through NYU, the New Arts Blueprint, and we, we sort of saw something very clearly in front of us, which was that we had become a project at the center of these sectors that weren't necessarily talking to each other, but were starting to become very aware of, of each other. And I mean the health sector, and especially the research element of the health sector, the art sector, and the policy sector. And what happened at the Met was that we managed to bring those people together on lots of panels and talk about seriously, you know, if there is a, a growing evidence of the health benefits of the arts, and we see the power of culture to tell that story and, and to bring people on that journey with us, and we have access through the WHO and through our contacts politically to get in front of ministers and arts and, and culture, then this project could be part of, a, of an attempt to improve the system. And that's what, where we're at now. That's what's really interesting, I think, about this, working with partners like the University of Houston and the city of Houston, is that you know, this isn't about just fixing one thing or going to one place. This is about looking at the arts as maybe something that has been not taken as seriously as it could have as a, as a health intervention. And Nisha will talk to the areas where there's such a growing body of evidence. Uh, so this is kind of a, an illustration of where we're at at the moment. And I just plug our next stop is uh, in India um, uh, in March, in Jaipur, um, where actually the, the craft community um, did an amazing response to COVID. There, uh, hundreds of thousands of people have been involved in creating these giant quilts where everyone made a tiny square, they were stitched together, and they were displayed in cities around India. So we're supporting and shining a light on this project, really to shine a light on the mental health challenge in India. I think they've just gone over a billion people there, so it's a priority area, of course, for the WHO. Um, and lastly, um, we find ourselves here in the wonderful city of Houston, and um, we have a very exciting program leading up to the symposium uh, uh, in September. Um, if you go to our website, you can see all the different events that we have. I'll just plug one thing before handing over to Florette, who's gonna talk a bit about Houston, which is the, um, we have an auction, an online auction that we're promoting um, to fund artist-led projects that address health issues, including a new project that we're going to support in Houston uh, which will be announced in partnership with the Contemporary Art Museum, Houston, later in the year. So that's uh, it for me for now. I hope I didn't go over. And uh, over to Ferret, uh, who's going to tell you a little bit more about Healing Arts Houston. Thank you so much, Stephen and Nisha. We're so happy that you could make it here during this difficult, mm -hmm. challenging time. I won't speak very long, but before I do anything, I want to give a shout out to the healthcare workers of Houston and this country and across the planet. And when I say uh, healthcare workers and all of their support staff and people who are caregivers in homes, parents, uh, I want us to make a commitment in this work that we're doing to think about the people who have done so much through this pandemic and are continuing to do this work. While we're here having this important conversation online and here at the University of Houston, we cannot forget that we are still smack dab in the thick of this pandemic and people are doing such incredible work day in and day out across this city and across this country. And so I, I want us to just remember that this work is not just for the privileged few, that we change the paradigm and we work to address the fact that there has been so much suffering um, across our communities and as artists, we have a really vital role to play in the recovery, and hopefully we'll be heading toward that recovery soon, uh, in addressing some of these community-based problems and larger issues that uh, the pandemic has uncovered these past two very difficult years. Houston is an incredible city. 
Um, I'm one of the many, many people that have been transplants here. I'm an originally a Torontonian, but I've been here for 20 years and raised my children here in Houston. Um, what we know about Houston now is that we are the number one most diverse city in this nation. We are also the home to the biggest medical center in the world. Maybe a little known fact is that we also have a thriving, incredible arts community. Individual artists, large and small arts institutions, and just as Stephen was talking about, this is the time to start thinking about the connectivity between all of these amazing resources that we have in the city. It's also time, I think, as an educator, time for us to talk about how to better position our artists and our students of the arts to be advocates, to be policy makers, and to not be afraid to come to the table with people, leaders in other areas of our communities, including healthcare workers, community workers, educators. So I think like in many sectors, we're in a place where we are going to have to start changing the paradigm. We're gonna to have to start thinking about how we're training up our artists in institutes of higher education. And like I said, we're gonna to have to think more about this idea of partnerships and collaborations. And this is a beginning step uh, towards that. And I'm so excited to be part of this conversation. About five years ago, I started to have a conversation with Todd Frazier, who you're going to hear from uh, very soon, about developing a certificate program for graduate students in arts and health. Todd was doing incredible work at um, Houston Methodist Hospital here uh, in Houston. And we actually started to see some of our students in the Arts Leadership Program, which is essentially a program about administration and management in the arts. We were finding that some of them were finding work uh, in healthcare environments as these arts and health programs were starting to develop. And so when Todd and I first started talking about this, it was really about expanding this notion of the pipeline, how to get our students a little bit more exposed to possible professional trajectories outside of the traditional nonprofit art scene. But I have to tell you, now that we have launched this certificate, and it's been running now for about two years, um, this notion of advocacy um, is becoming a little bit more paramount than it was before the pandemic. Um, so right now we're in year two of this certificate. I want to give a shout out to the three incredible women who teach in my program, Shay Kula, Jennifer Townsend, and Caroline Dockra, who are all actually uh, full-time employees at Houston Methodist and also teach as adjuncts in my program. They're an example of um, leaders who started off as artists themselves and found themselves now working in this important area of arts and health within a clinical setting. So um, just very quickly and lastly, I would just like to plug the program a little bit. Um, this is a three uh, course program, so it's not very long. It is a graduate certificate. Um, if you are a graduate student currently, uh, at the University of Houston, it is something that you can pick up to extend your education. And if you already have a graduate degree and you're outside of uh, the University of Houston system right now, you can apply to the program. So the application is May 1st. We would love to see this program develop, um, possibly one day into a full-fledged degree program. Uh, Lord knows there's enough work that has to be done in our community and beyond. And um, hopefully somebody, I'm not sure if it's possible, maybe somebody can drop a link actually to our program in the chat if that function is available online. Um, but you can also just do a Google search, UH Arts and Health Certificate. Um, we are so heartbroken that we couldn't all be together as we had planned for the original conference here in Houston at the University of Houston, but so excited that we have the chance to have the beginnings of this conversation. And I so look forward to seeing all of you in September. Thank you. Misha. Thank you, Florette. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Stephen. I mean, my experience, this is my first visit to Houston. And last night, I went to the Contemporary Art Museum and experienced the Dirty South, which is the exhibit yeah. that they have on now, Fantastic. which is unbelievable. And so I will appeal to all of you, if you have the opportunity and are in the city, to please go and see it. Because to me, it brought home the psychological, physical, and social impact of the arts in the sense that I had a physiological reaction to so much of what I was witnessing. I felt very moved. Of course, art moves us, and it moves us towards 
action, right? And there in that space, I was able to link my own um, past history, experiences of migration. I come from a family of refugees who then migrated to Canada, and I recently moved to the States. Um, so there's that psychological impact that's happening and bearing witness to this work in terms of how communities have formed, how they have struggled, how they have survived. And then there's the social aspect as we're there together, experiencing something, bearing witness, noticing the reactions, opening up conversations. Please go and see it. And I know something about what this is to pivot on a dime. As so many of us do, I had the pleasure of moderating our opening panel for the event that we held at the Met. And so I want to come back to something that you said around this work is not for you know, the privileged few. And when we think about the opening report uh, that Chris mentioned, the seminal report looking at the health benefits of the arts, that was, um, you know, the lead author was our colleague Daisy Fancourt at University College London. She really, you know, their, their work looked at 3,000 studies, and those studies had a, had a variety of methodologies, right? Some of them were qualitative studies, there were randomized control trials, case cohort studies. There were many different ways of knowing, and that's what I want to emphasize here. Because this work, you know, I came from a community arts background, moved into the creative arts therapies, and along that trajectory have discovered many different ways of working, many different ways of knowing. Um, I'll come back to that, that piece in just a second, but just to say that, you know, as we're talking about the arts and health, we're talking about so many different practices. We've, we've been talking a lot about artists engaging in, with health themes and in healthcare environments, but we could also be talking about community-engaged artists, arts educators and creative arts therapists, um, people who are working in the medical humanities, performing arts medicine. There's a, a whole variety of different practices that find themselves engaged in what we talk about when we talk about the arts and health. So we had this opening study, and one of the important things I'll emphasize about this study was that they really laid out the benefits of the arts with regards to prevention and health promotion, as well as management and treatment in a number of different areas. Next slide. And I won't go into all of these in detail. You can take a look at these areas of measurable impact. All of them could be opened up into a great deal of detail. I'll focus perhaps more specifically on um, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, one of the areas of work that I specialized in, I specialized in trauma, and then I've moved into um, looking at Parkinson's disease more specifically. My colleagues at NYU in art therapy uh, have been working with the Fresco Institute uh, for movement disorders, taking a look at the neurological basis of art therapy, what's happening when people are engaging in art therapy, uh, and specifically vis-a-vis -vis, uh, with regards to Parkinson's disease, and found uh, significant improvements in quality of life as well as visual spatial functioning. And we got really curious about this in drama therapy as well. And I'm going to show you a video now. We're going to show you a video that um, that was created by the WHO Europe office, um, focusing on one case study in Sweden, where you'll see a gentleman um, come alive through dance, somebody who's struggling with Parkinson's disease and his experience. So we can try to uh, bring this home with a human story. Let's see if this video works. Almost. Jag får ofta en känsla av att saker och ting tas ifrån mig. Jag kan inte längre göra det här som jag gjorde tidigare. Eller jag orkar inte med saker som jag tidigare orkade. Jag kunde inte längre bara stå vid sidan om eller säga att ja, jag har det bra. För även om jag har det bra så påverkar sjukdomen mig varje dag. Påminner om att jag är sjuk. Jag heter Bengt och jag har Parkinson sjukdom. Innan jag fick Parkinson så levde jag ett väldigt aktivt liv. Det var några år sedan. Härligt att fylla 50. Mm. 
Att ha Parkinson innebär att det tas ifrån dig bit efter bit. När jag fick Parkinson så förstod jag på ett nytt sätt att livet har ett slut. Jag har ansvar för att fylla det med så mycket positivt som jag kan. Lisbeth, min fru, upptäckte en annons i tidningen som handlade om dans för Parkinson. Trots att jag var väldigt skeptisk så anmälde Lisbeth mig till det och sa att gå dit och pröva. När jag sa till mina vänner att jag ska börja på Ballettakademin så skrattade de. Liksom jag skrattade. Det går inte. Efter första gången så kände jag att det här vill jag göra mer av. Att dansa för Parkinson, det är ett sätt att frigöra glädjen och det friska hos dig som du trodde hade försvunnit. Men det finns där. Ganska långt in men det finns. När den som man älskar får en sån här livslång diagnos på en sjukdom där allt bara blir sämre och sämre så ställer det stora krav på relationen. Det gäller att kunna skapa ett gott liv under nya förutsättningar. Och dansen är jättebra, då är Bengt glad, då blir jag också glad. Dans för Parkinson gör att jag får glädje tillbaka. Att jag fylls av energi och att livet blir något lättare att leva. Um, and hopefully, you know, one thing that you take away from that video is the joy that is just, you know, so present on his face and present in the encounters that he's having. And this was also true in our art therapy and Parkinson's study at, at NYU, where one of the findings was that people were more likely to adhere to a course of treatment because they enjoyed it. They found it intrinsically joyful and, and you know, these, these intrinsically joyful activities could yield many extrinsic social physical, mental health benefits. So coming back to the research, one, you know, part of my role in this effort is to support the coordination of research as we continue to advance what we know about the health benefits of the arts. So my International Research Consortium, the Creative Arts Therapies Consortium, uh, was commissioned by Chris to map the evidence for the health benefits of the creative arts therapies and the arts with stated therapeutic intent. And we did so up to 2021. And this slide here just demonstrates that you can see a real increase. You can see a, a steady progression in terms of uh, the research in this area. We did a systematic review of systematic reviews, which is a very bird's eye view, taking a look at approximately 15,000 studies. If you took a look at the number of studies represented in these systematic reviews, you can see a steady increase. We do have a marker there that, sig that signifies where uh, COVID-19 hit. Um, and, you know, we're continuing to, uh, the, the studies continue to increase. I, I don't really, I can't really say, you know, that there's a correlation between the sharp trajectory that you see there and COVID-19. I'd like to think that we were all squirreled away at home, busy writing, and finally getting our publications out. I'm not sure, but these were all studies that were available to us by 2021, so I, I think not. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, my apologies already for the very, very tiny detail. We'll fix that. This is actually data. These data are just coming to us now in a publication that we'll be putting forward later this year. But what you're seeing here are bar graphs that speak to where is the concentration of research, right? So over here on my right, we can see that um, artists engaging in healthcare settings, the arts with stated therapeutic intent. There's a great deal of research there. That's the middle bar there 
followed by research in the creative arts therapies. On my left, it's that same bar graph, only with um, color coding to look at which arts modalities are really well represented in systematic reviews of the health benefits of the arts so far. And music is highly, highly represented in the creative arts therapies that's followed by art therapy, dance therapy, mixed modalities, um, drama and poetry, and then the arts with stated therapeutic intent. You see music really well represented again. And I point this out because it's starting to give us an indication as to where there is a concentration of research and we can start to look at scalability. What can we start to amplify? And where might we need more feasibility studies, pilot studies? You know, where might we need to put a little bit more attention? Next slide. Okay, again, very tiny uh, print here, but you can see that um, the highest, uh, with regards to population groups or clinical outcomes, the highest level of research here is actually, you know, between non-clinical populations, so just arts for prevention, promotion, general health and well-being, followed by mental health and dementia. Now, dementia is another area of research that our consortium has been deeply engaged in. Next slide. Um, you know, again, as Stephen mentioned earlier, working with this trifecta of practice, research, and policy, we really have an avenue to be able to take our research and amplify it further. So you see a cover of a report here that was authored by um, our team, and really the data analysis, uh, data collection analysis, I really have to say, I have to say thank you to Suprita Aital and Libby Flynn, who are... Um, our, our researchers from, uh, from Edge Hill University and uh, University of Melbourne. So this is really an international effort. Um, they've pulled together this study on, um, which was an extraction of that systematic review of reviews. So we took a look at 82 systematic reviews on the role of the arts in dementia care. And we found that, you know, when you look at the arts in this area, there are about um, six areas that are really impacted by the arts, beginning with self-expression, social connection, mood, quality of life, cognitive function, and behavioral and psychological symptoms. And Chris saw an avenue for us to take this uh, research further. The WHO guidelines um, revision committee was meeting to take a look at guidelines pertaining to dementia care. We sent them this research and we just learned uh, recently, just a couple of months ago, that they are now taking it uh, under advisement, they're reviewing it. And if it were to be adopted, it would be the first example of research on arts-based interventions being taken up in global policy. That's what this can do. I'll pass it back over to Chris, actually, if he's still with us. still with us? There. Chris is there in the health assembly somewhere. Uh, Chris, and hopefully we'll be able to we're his going voice. to turn it over to Chris Bailey, who is uh, going to tell us a little bit more about moving from the research that Nisha is discussing toward policy. Chris? Sure. Um, I, I'm going to keep uh, uh, these comments brief so that we, we can perhaps uh, go into a bit of a questioning and, and discussion uh, mode. And I think everyone's heard me talk quite a bit so far, um, only to say that um, part of our goal with uh, working with these different research centers ar around the world is to create this virtuous triangle between practice, research, and policy to make sure that uh, policies informed with actual robust evidence, um, but that it is connected to uh, actual practice as well, that it's not um, created in a silo. And uh, to that end, there are a number of different research centers from around the world that are joining our network of WHO collaborating centers to contribute uh, to the building of this evidence base. The Steinhardt School that uh, Nisha represents is one of them, and she's described some of the work that we've been collaborating on. We're also working with uh, Susan Mangsaman at Johns Hopkins, and um, uh, one of the products that, that she has created with the Aspen Institute is the NeuroArts Blueprint. And in particular, that collaborating center is going to look at, um, uh, in, in more detail, the evidence for 
the biochemical and neurological underpinnings of the, the, the healing benefits of the arts. Um, we're also working with uh, Jill Sonke at uh, the U University of Florida. And uh, one of the projects we're working with her is standardizing some outcome measures uh, for community-based arts projects uh, that, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, tor towards um, uh, health outcomes. And the idea there is, is so that we have a framework that we can compare apples to apples uh, across uh, data sets. Um, uh, and we're even working with the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda uh, on a large scoping survey of, of uh, arts-based uh, health interventions at the community level across Africa um, as, as a project. So as we move forward, more and more research centers are coming forward and approaching us and filling out this this mosaic of, of evidence and practice uh, towards policy. And uh, as far as um, uh, the, the details of that and the nuances of that, I think we'll cover that in the next session. So I won't uh, go into detail here, but I'm just very excited by the number of people that we're discovering working in this space. And, and I guess uh, that excitement is shared by uh, the others who are coming forward, because many of them didn't know about this wider network. And uh, in, in this particular field, many people are out there working uh, often by themselves. So I think part of our goal is to bring together the community of practitioners, researchers, and policymakers as, uh, a, as a community. Uh, and and discovering each other, supporting each other, and, and bringing this forward with the goal of improving health, particularly of underserved populations. Chris, thank you. Uh, I wonder if I could pose a question to the panel in the few remaining minutes. Uh, you're all talking about the importance of strategic partnerships uh, Stephen uh, gave us a really good overview, in fact, of strategic partnerships and, and why they're important. Uh, Florette uh, also commented on this. Uh, and Nisha has given us a great overview of the research. Uh, Chris is talking about moving this toward policy. So in order for the partnerships to succeed, and in order, order for us to move from the research to the policy, this requires data, and it requires uh, uh, normally a large amount of it. Uh, and I guess I'm thinking of a question for Nisha, but I'd be curious to hear anyone else's comments because all of you have worked on this to some degree. But can you talk a little bit more about the data landscape? Uh, you, you've mentioned it, and we've seen the, that you certainly have a great deal of it. Can you talk a little bit more about the data landscape from a perspective of what you referred to as different ways of knowing, and I think of also as, as different ways of demonstrating sometimes? Yes. But what, what does the data landscape look like, and where are the challenges? in this field in terms of the data and, and using the data to move policy? Yeah, I'll start with the challenge piece. Um, you know, we're working in an environment where we, um, we're working in a very diverse environment where practitioners are working on the ground, doing very meaningful work, may not have the skills to be able to translate, translate that work into a research study. So there's the work of forming partnerships with researchers to be able to take that work further. There's the funding that's needed to be able to support that. Um, so that's, that's one key challenge, and it, it taps into that question around methodologies. You know, one of the things that came through in Daisy's uh, report was, you know, they reported mm -hmm. on a diverse, uh, diverse set of studies, different approaches, different, different ways of knowing. And mm -hmm. I mentioned the opening launch panel that we did at the Met. That really came through that panel as well. It was really mm -hmm. emphasized by our colleague in Jogge Karangwa at the University of Global Health Equity that we really need to celebrate and reinforce diverse ways of knowing. And that comes up against what we think about when we think about legitimate science, which is often conflated with randomized control trials as the gold standard, you know, the experimental study is the gold standard. Now, when we know from taking a look at vaccine trials, for example, 
we really want the gold standard. We really do want to know that we can trust what we're putting in our bodies and at the same time have to recognize that there are different pathways to knowing. So that's, that's a tension. That's a tension that we're holding in this work and that we want to reinforce and we want to continue to celebrate. Because it ties into the other piece that you mentioned, and Chris mentioned this too, which is that people are seldom moved by bar graphs, that we need to bring it alive through story and song and performance, and that's really critical, uh, both in terms of knowledge translation, how we communicate the findings, but also how we come to know what's happening in a practice. Dancers know something intuitively about what the dance is doing, and we need to value that knowledge. So I'll say a little bit there. I mean, I think um, the challenge of coordinating research in a very diverse field that uh, still needs a great deal of coordination is something that I think, you know, perhaps our colleagues will speak to in the next panel as well. I know Najwika from um, the National Organization of Arts and Health would have something to say about that too. I wanted to add something very quickly to that, Nisha, which is that the importance, the critical importance right now of educators who work in fine arts programs, especially at the graduate level, but perhaps this can also be introduced at the undergraduate level, the importance of empowering artists themselves to understand what these metrics are, understand the process of research, understand, have, have a sense of data literacy, this is going to become more and more important, not just as it relates to arts and health, but the sector as a whole, arts and culture as a whole. There's, there's quite a proliferation right now of arts administration, arts management programs uh, that are starting to become more and more aware of the importance of research in the fine and performing arts. So um, I also want to give a shout out to A2RU, who's doing some great work already. I know, Nisha, you're going to be involved in that as well. Um, and also NOAA, who you mentioned, the National Organization of Arts and Health, who just recently released their first textbook of core curriculum for this area of arts and health. And that's gonna help us as educators, that's gonna help us in the area of advocacy, and I think in the area of policy making as well. So this, this is a real sea change, I think. This is sort of a revolution in terms of how we train artists, positioning them to be a part of these larger conversations getting them out of this idea of that their work ends when you know the piece is launched or the piece of artwork is completed in the studio or the show is closed. There's a whole ecosystem that artists need to be a part of and as educators I think we need to be uh, encouraging and enforcing that. I would say one more thing on the, you know, coming from the outside, from the art side and starting to read all these reports which, you know, are quite intimidating when you, when you get them. And, and, and also, so that one side, and then looking at the political climate now, where, you know, this idea of, of you know, science, solid science, solid data, is really all mixed up with, with the way that that data is, is, is wrapped into a story. And I think this is where even the head of arts and health at the NEA said to us that, you know, the, the, the science community, research community, really needs the arts community in order to help to communicate that data. Because yes. it's not about data for data's sake, it's yes. about influencing policy. And also we've got to be realistic about what policy, policy makers are influenced by celebrities, That's and right. they're influenced by media, and they're influenced by events. So we've also seen this power of the art world to, let's say, woo mm -hmm. policy makers, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw it at the Met, and uh, an institution like the Met is extremely powerful. Uh, with that, so we see definitely a, a kind of uh, um, uh, investigation ahead of us of okay, well, if we've got this community of the arts and we've got this community of researchers, what can we do innovatively to sort of move this data uh, into into action, into policy, and into action? I know we're running out of time, but just very quickly, I think you're so right. The importance of storytelling in any, I and mean, we've seen this through the pandemic, messaging, storytelling, who better to do that than artists mm -hmm. in whatever medium? And, you know, it's been said, right? He who, uh, you know, tells the story owns the culture, you know? So this process of storytelling is something that we also have to really start talking about with our artists and our arts majors and our art students and, and, and connecting the dots with how storytelling puts data and science into context for the broader community. So I think that's really important as well. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you all. Um, I think we've run out of time, so uh, we're going to call it a conclusion of the panel. I'm hearing a really robust round of virtual applause for our three <laughs> panelists, Florette Fernando, Nisha Sajnani, Stephen Stapleton. Thank you all so much. Thanks. We'll take a five-minute uh, gap so we can transition to the next session. Thank you so much.